Well, it really depends in part on the cause of the pulmonary hypertension. The, uh, and one of the key steps, once we find that there is an elevation in that pressure, which we may estimate by an ultrasound of the heart or echocardiography, and would confirm by doing a heart catheterization, actually measuring the pressures in the right side of the heart, um, then we have to put this into really one of five categories for what might be causing the pulmonary hypertension. And once that classification occurs, we can have a little bit better understanding of what the best treatments are. Now, when we talk about what we call pulmonary arterial hypertension, that is really the kind of pulmonary hypertension that is uh, potentially responsive to very specific treatments that relax the lung vessels without dropping the blood pressure too much. And these are really pulmonary arterial hypertension specific therapies. And there are two different categories of, of oral medications. One is the endothelin receptor antagonists. Endothelin is a really potent vasoconstrictor substance that really kind of tends to contract the lung vessels and there are drugs that will block that receptor for that uh, peptide and that will help the lung vessels to relax. In addition, there are what we call phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, which are things like sildenafil and tadalafil that were originally really developed for erectile dysfunction but really dilate the lung vessels very nicely. And so those are also approved therapies for pulmonary arterial hypertension. And there are also what we call prostanoids and a whole variety of prostanoids that can either be inhaled or in investigational form taken as a pill or can also be infused with a 24-hour-a-day pump either under the skin or into a blood vessel. Um, and those drugs are very effective but really need to be monitored closely because they're very potent and so those vasodilators are the kinds of things that we use. Now, specialized pulmonary hypertension clinics are important because the therapies are relatively complex. They can have significant side effects. Patients need to be monitored very closely to make sure that they're responding appropriately and that they're on the optimal dose of the medication. And so it really requires a big support system of our healthcare providers, including nurses and secretaries and physicians, uh, in order to make this really be effective. Uh, our nurses may talk to our patients uh, one to three times a week, depending on what's going on with their condition, and then touch bases with us about things so that we can really coordinate the care of the patient, even when they're not here at the clinic. And that sort of infrastructure uh, takes a lot of, of effort to make that work well. And the other thing that can be beneficial about coming to a place like the Mayo Clinic for care of pulmonary hypertension is that we really have the whole range of, of the, both diagnostic techniques to make sure we understand the disease process as well as possible, but also a whole range of treatments available, including these approved treatments and the ability to monitor them properly, and also investigational treatments these investigational treatments uh, include oral forms of prostanoids that can try to reduce the need to use an intravenous catheter to infuse the medicine or a need to infuse it under the skin, and we're studying those to see how effective they are as part of research projects in partner with the industry uh, that creates these medications. In addition, uh, because this process of pulmonary hypertension is not only something that constricts the lung vessels, but obstructs the lung vessels by excess proliferation of, of cells in the blood vessels, there's increasing interest in not only dilating the vessels, but trying to stop them from proliferating and getting narrow. And so that sort of adjunctive approach is really very exciting, and I suspect in that area, sometime in the next 10 or 20 years, we may really find the cure for this disease, but we will never find it if we don't see the patients with the disease to try to study and understand whether these new therapies work. That's another reason we think it's important for patients to be seen at a major pulmonary hypertension center like the Mayo Clinic so that we can offer them these types of possible investigational therapies and help to learn together what the future really will be in treating this difficult disease. 
And so uh, projects are starting up now with what, what, go, what we call tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are medications that can be very effective to treat certain cancers. In a way, this proliferative process in pulmonary hypertension, although not malignant, is, is akin to a cancer in terms of the way it can progress. And so this, this thinking of a, of a really different strategy for treating the disease we think is very important. And so randomized trials of these sorts of therapies are going on here at Mayo now. The other issue is that certain forms of pulmonary hypertension can be cured, what we call thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, where people may have blood clots that have gone into the lungs from their legs or other blood vessels. They may not even have a history of having unknown blood clots where they never really had a clot in the leg or something, but clots may have been there, broken off silently, and over time plug up the blood vessels in the lungs. And if that diagnosis is not made, then it can never be corrected, and patients may be at risk for having more clots, which can be life-threatening. And this is a process that, in the proper hands, can sometimes be cured surgically by having really talented surgeons take out the fibrotic clot. It's not just sort of loose, gelatinous, fresh thrombus, but it gets fibrotic and hard and essentially has to be shelled out of the lung vessels. And this is quite an intricate operation because it's not only requiring cardiopulmonary bypass, which is relatively common for bypass operations and grafts and things like that, but actually requires what we call deep circulatory arrest, where the circulation is actually stopped, the patient's cooled way down to protect their neurologic status, and the surgeons quickly work in 10 to 20 minute spells to shell out that material to open up the obstruction. And with that, a patient who has very severe pulmonary hypertension can potentially walk out of the hospital with normal or near normal pulmonary pressures and not have trouble with it again as long as they take blood thinners to prevent more clot from forming. We have the expertise to do that kind of an operation here at the Mayo Clinic. I should also mention that some patients don't respond to any of these kinds of approaches and could end up requiring lung transplantation. Mayo also has a, a dedicated transplant center that includes the potential for evaluation and listing for lung or heart-lung transplantation, depending on what might, might be required. And so coming to a major center like Mayo can give patients the option not only for conventional, traditional therapy that will be monitored very carefully with close follow-up to make sure that everything is going the way it should, the potential for investigational therapies that we've discussed, and the potential for lung transplantation if that's what's required. In addition, some patients have pulmonary hypertension that would fall into what we call a group two, which is where the left side of the heart is causing blood and pressure to back up towards the lung vessels. And those patients might have what we call diastolic heart failure, where the heart contracts well, but it doesn't fill properly. And that condition can be associated with shortness of breath, tendency to fluid retention, um, and exercise intolerance. And we're doing research studies here at Mayo for patients with that form of pulmonary hypertension to try to ascertain whether any of the uh, therapies that we use may benefit them specifically, especially the what we call phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, so the drugs like sildenafil, um, because those drugs are the one class of drug that we use to treat pulmonary hypertension that might actually lower left-sided filling pressures as well, and so could help the pulmonary hypertension and also the left side of the heart. And those, those are investigational studies. We don't have proof that it's effective, but they're important studies because it's a fairly large number of patients who have that kind of a condition. And right now, aside from good blood pressure control and good fluid management, we don't have any specific treatments for what we call diastolic heart failure, which is, falls under what we call group two pulmonary hypertension. There are also patients that have what we call group three pulmonary hypertension, which are those associated with uh, intrinsic lung diseases like pulmonary fibrosis or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and, and those types of illnesses that are really affecting the, the tissue in the lung very directly. And um, for those patients, 
we try to correct their oxygen levels, often the oxygen levels are low. Some patients have sleep disordered breathing where their oxygen levels drop at night, either obstructive or central sleep apnea, and that's like climbing a mountain every night. And, and essentially when you go to sleep, if your oxygen levels drop, your lung vessels constrict, and that really works the circulation in a very detrimental way. And so we're very careful to screen our patients for the possibility that their oxygen levels are dropping at night, that they have a form of central or obstructive sleep apnea, and treating that aggressively to make sure that the oxygen levels don't drop at night. Um, and so that's something else that's important to look for, especially because obstructive sleep apnea is very common uh, at this point in time. and, and so. There are a lot of patients out there who are tired, they have exercise intolerance, they um, fall asleep easily during the day, they're short of breath with activities, and some of those patients have obstructive sleep apnea that if you treated it, they'd feel tremendously better. So it's just a, another example of the kind of disease that can be associated with pulmonary hypertension that we really need to look for. So pulmonary hypertension, we wouldn't really consider a diagnosis just all by itself. Is that a freestanding diagnosis? It's just like congestive heart failure. It's always congestive heart failure due to what? Blockage in the heart arteries or dilated cardiomyopathy or restrictive cardiomyopathy. And, and for us, that's the same way. It's pulmonary hypertension due to what? And if you can't say what it's due to, you might call it idiopathic or unknown, but you at least are able to put it into a category where you know what kind of treatments are appropriate. And another reason to come to a place like the Mayo Clinic is to be as sure as possible that the pulmonary hypertension has been properly categorized so that the treatment can be optimized. There are certain conditions that are associated with pulmonary hypertension that really require that those patients should be screened for it in the sense that, well, you say, well, if I'm real short of breath, maybe I have this, it should be looked for. But we're also learning that in certain illnesses that are associated with the possibility of pulmonary hypertension, if we find the disease process earlier, we're more likely to be effective in treating it. This particularly includes patients with connective tissue diseases like scleroderma, and usually rheumatologists care for patients like that who have scleroderma, derma is skin, sclero is kind of hardening, and this is a process that can cause hardening of the tissues, sometimes in the hands or the other parts of the skin, sometimes in the face, um, and can also be associated with pulmonary hypertension where there's hardening and, and scarring within the lung vessels and constriction of those vessels. And it's, that association is common enough that any patient who has a diagnosis of scleroderma, it's now recommended that they be screened for pulmonary hypertension by talking to them about symptoms, doing a careful physical exam, doing an electrocardiogram and a chest x-ray, and an echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart where those pressures can be estimated. And often we'll also do a six minute walk where they just walk up and down the hall for six minutes and say, are your oxygen levels staying normal? Can you walk a normal distance? Or are you actually doing less than would be considered normal? And if there's evidence of possible pulmonary hypertension on these initial non-invasive evaluations, then we may well recommend going ahead and, and doing a outpatient heart catheterization to measure the pressures in the lungs directly to try to confirm whether pulmonary hypertension exists. And again, randomized trials have carefully looked at this in patients who have this condition and have even relatively moderate pulmonary hypertension, and it really looks like finding it and treating it makes a difference in terms of outcome of those patients. We also would tend to screen for this in patients with mixed connective tissue disease and sometimes diseases like lupus, especially if, um, if the patients have any signs of shortness of breath. There are other associations as well. A small percentage of patients who have HIV infection will develop pulmonary hypertension. Not enough that we screen all of them for pulmonary hypertension, but we ask them questions about it. And if they do have symptoms of shortness of breath, or anything else that would suggest the possibility of pulmonary hypertension, then they should have a screening echocardiogram because uh, it can also be treated in that setting as well.